Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live webinar. I hope you're having a good mood and uh, ready to learn a bit more about North American shipping container market today with us. While you're joining, please check out the chat. Um, introduce yourself. We'd love to know which company you represent, where you're from. And we'll wait for one, two minutes um, for everyone to join today. Hello, hello. I will keep welcoming everybody in our wonderful webinar today. Lovely. I see Alex with us today. Thanks for joining. Uh, happy to see more of you uh, writing in the chat. And let me uh, introduce myself and uh, a wonderful co-host today. So my name is Ivan. I'm a uh, part of Container Exchange representing the Insights product. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward into sharing more data today with you. Laura, a few words from your end. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you everyone so much for joining our webinar. My name is Laura Robb. Um, my role is associate editor, price reporter, uh, specializing in the America's container market. So every day I'm communicating with carriers, freight forwarders, BCOs, NBOCCs, importers, exporters, really anyone who can offer insight to the different uh, facets of the container industry. While I'm primarily maritime, I always make an effort to kind of understand the intermodal elements just because it is also nuanced. And I'm very excited to uh, discuss the North American shipping container market with you guys today. Wonderful. Very good. All right, um, then let us move on and then move on with the agenda today. Um, I have a lot of points uh, prepared for you, but we're also looking forward to your questions at the very end. So feel free to write them down in the chat and we'll come back to that um, afterwards. So the agenda today covers a lot of points. You can see them on the screen. This is about the economic situation in North America and the factors attributing to freight rates uh, what actually influencing that, what we're doing with overcapacity and container free market, the latest uh, container prices and leasing terms in the US and Canada, and of course, recommendations, what we can do together or you can do actually for your business to become even more profitable. This year. So uh, feel free to ask questions once again. We'd love to see them uh, by the end of um, the webinar uh, and the recording will be also shared with participants afterwards. Um, in the meanwhile, we also prepared for you a little poll. So if you would like to share with us more information, you'll see a little pop up on your end. Um, there are two questions. Um, please um, yeah, read an, uh, an answer. So the questions, whether you are uh, managing any containers, you have any fleet on your end. And of course, the second one, what kind of type of data uh, would be beneficial to your business? First question, I think it's just only one answer and then second one is multiple answers. So would love to know a bit more about you. Um, thank you very much. I hope uh, we receive a lot of um, answers by that. Um, let's probably kick off then with the main part. So Laura, I'm passing the word to you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ivan. Um, so, to start with, let's kind of just unpack what we've seen over the past several years and what drove that volatility and kind of where those drivers are now. So right off the bat, everyone knows how significantly congested it was um, as consumer demand increased during the pandemic. We saw uh, record high congestion, record high rates, um, but now we've normalized and returned to much more stable levels for North American imports. Um, here you can see East Coast and West Coast imports from North Asia, as well as our Platts Container Index, which is a weighted average of all of our routes. Um, so as you, there was a lot of volatility through the end of 20 into mid-2022, but we've seen that, um, that import demand drop off significantly. 
Similarly, we saw upticks for exports. Um, here we have East Coast and West Coast North American exports to North Asia, and they saw their own um, uptick, be it it wasn't as large as imports, they saw a lot of hurdles with equipment and uh, obviously were affected by the congestion. Um, so that volatility affected a lot of importers and carriers, exporters, everyone across the board. Um, and we're gonna unpack kind of what happened as well as what those factors are doing now to influence our current market. Um, so starting at the beginning of the pandemic, importing fell off slightly. You can see this mild decline there um, because importers didn't know what consumer demand was going to look like um, moving forward. But it became pretty evident quickly that consumer demand was going up. Um, a lot of retail therapy, a lot of uh, shifting your spending patterns from buying, uh, spending money on services to buying goods. Uh, people were upgrading their homes as they spent more time at home and importers caught wind of that. Um, this next box represents our pre-Lunar New Year rush. I think that this is particularly interesting because while we usually have a volume uptick and subsequently a rate uptick as space tightens before Lunar New Year, um, this one was unusually large and little elements like this kind of can forecast what things look like moving forward for demand. Um, so that uptick was significant and we saw crazy port congestion, really, really high rates. Um, and that was affected importers significantly as they weren't unable to get their cargo to their its final destinations. Um, another hurdle that we were facing were West Coast labor disruptions. Um, while we're still having that conversation in a different way now, and I'll, I will get to that, uh, we saw the West Coast uh, desirability fall off a bit as importers were desperate to get their goods in and they already faced significant hurdles in terms of congestion, congestion and rates. They did not want to add another variable to that um, in the form of potential labor disruptions. Um, Still through 2022 into 23, we saw that weak demand, um, low uh, inflationary pressures, low economic sentiment really begin to take hold of uh, consumer uh, patterns. And as such, we've seen those prices normalize. Um, this last box is really what we're dealing with now, which are these failed GRI attempts that we've seen on behalf of car carriers in uh, May. And I think that this is data is actually through June. That being said, while that market failed to support the GRI attempts because demand was so low and there's so much space, we are starting to see a shift in the past week or two that um, mm -hmm. those um, that in that pulled capacity and those shifted services are starting to really have uh, some pull for the market. All right, and where we are now? Yes, where we are now. Um, so. What we have looked at these labor hurdles um, on the West Coast that affected the ILWU, the rail, and both of which um, West Coast is very, very rely relies on for getting cargo out. Um, now we're starting to see potential disruptions in Canadian ports. And while those have tentatively reached an agreement and could be cooling off and no longer relevant by tomorrow, we are um, seeing that backlog have an effect on um, space availability, especially for uh, nearby ports like Seattle and Tacoma. Um, another union that we saw affecting like uh, desirability of the West Coast was the rail union, which further contributed to the coastal shift and actually influenced some importers to switch their intermodal methods from uh, rail to trucks. Um, we also saw crazy equipment hurdles. Nobody could get containers or chassis, but we're no longer seeing those now. Um, equipment has become much more available. But that being said, as we look at these declining imports, if we don't receive uh, containers at the rate needed, we could be looking mm -hmm. at hurdles for exporters um, moving forward a little bit down the road as we don't have the same amount of equipment available. Um, here is that display of what that coastal shift looks like a little bit more. Um, you can see in 2022, West Coast lost a significant portion of market share to the East and Gulf Coast. And we expect that trend to continue. Um, once East and Gulf Coast ports start seeing that kind of profitability, they don't wanna let go of that market share. And understandably, we see a lot of um, 
port improvements, um, people try port uh, operations trying to make uh, room for larger vessels. And uh, we expect that East and Gulf Coast ports will remain very competitive um, moving forward. Um, so right now, one of the main things we're looking at uh, is the shifting capacity. We have seen a lot of low demand in the past several months for the Trans-Pacific lane. As such, carriers are shifting their fleet away from that trade. Um, while these volumes are low, that means that rates and margins are also low and carriers want to uh, react accordingly, manage that capacity, move those vessels to more profitable lanes like Latin America, and we are starting to see that space tighten. While rates have been very weak and have not supported GRIs, the effects of that shifting capacity are really starting to take hold of the market currently as we start to see minor, minor volume upticks. Um, that being said, one example of the shifted capacity is MSC trimming their trans-Pacific tonnage by 7% compared to last year. Um, but still, the Asia-North American trade has 18% of the market capacity uh, just after Europe, which has 21%. Uh, right now, as we see that congestion continue to ease with low volumes, liner reliability, schedule reliability is trending upward. Um, you can see these top two lines in dark teal and yellow represent pre-pandemic uh, liner reliability levels, which were, were pretty reliable for all intents and purposes. Um, but through 2020, you can see this purple line drop off significantly and um, remain low through 2021 at this lavender level down there. Um, however, through 2022, as that demand started to wane, we saw reliability pick up a bit and we expect it to continue upward. As many of you know, though, we are heading into um, what would traditionally be a peak season. Well, I don't think we're going to have a peak season uh, materialize at any like actual uh, mentionable rate influencing rates. I do think that we are going to see uh, that slight reliability, we're going to see it lose its momentum. Um, we expect it to continue getting better, but as we head into a season with a bit more volumes, they have removed that capacity and we are starting to see those effects. So I don't know that it will have the same jump that we were looking at from say January to February. Um, that being said, we are seeing uh, more blank sailings in the very recent weeks, and we're starting to see that space constraints that um, were presented this most recent month of, throughout July. Um, Maersk had the best schedule reliability uh, with more than 73%, and uh, some shippers are still citing those uh, increased space constraints, especially into the West Coast, um, moving into August as well as September. So looking at that overcapacity a bit closer, uh, we are seeing space constraints. And that is because carriers are using the tools in their toolbox to control the capacity being added to the market. However, the big picture, not just looking at the Trans-Pacific Lane in this week, we're seeing significant influxes in uh, vessel capacity. On the Asia West Coast Lane, West Coast North America Lane, we're seeing up to 38%. Uh, East Coast imports from Asia almost 60%, and Alpha Liner predicts uh, 2.3 million TEUs in 2023 with 2.8 million TEUs added next year. Um, for comparison, in 21 and 22, the market added 1.1 million TEUs each year, respectively. Um, here you can see that uh, pull out a bit more and how we compare the fleet, the capacity growth in 2023 compared to um, the 2016 to 2019 average, as well as 2019. So it's very significant and it will definitely be affecting um, the supply demand balance and thus rates, but it's not uh, just indicative that rates are going to fall. Uh, here we can break down what that order book looks like a bit more. MSC especially has a very significant order book, but all of our main characters carriers are adding um, significant uh, vessels to their fleet. Another thing to be considering currently are that MSC and Maersk are still in an alliance, though that alliance is set to dissolve in the next several years. So these two giant carriers are no longer going to be working together, which we expect to add uh, significant uh, 
uh, competitiveness to the market. I see. Laura, I have actually a question here. Maybe you can help me to find an answer. Um, since we're growing so much the capacity and then there are many, many, um, um, yeah, like ships and the auto book. So what would the carriers do to actually call by the situation? Are there any tools they can use? Yes, absolutely. So to manage that overcapacity in the freight market, there are things that carriers can do. Things we're seeing currently and um, some tools that are kind of implemented in the background. Right now we're seeing an uptick in blank sailings. Um, so as carriers see profitability wane, they're not just going to watch their profits disappear. They are going to implement things to make sure that rates stay at sustainable levels so that they can operate correctly. Um, we're also seeing a lot of those shifting services, as I had mentioned, away from less lucrative trades to more lucrative trades, um, and also in an effort to kind of add uh, some support to that supply demand imbalance on those less lucrative trades, as well as um, idling and retrofitting and scrapping existing vessels. We're also seeing more slow steaming and just because I showed you that order book and they have all these ships on the order book, doesn't mean all of those ships will come to fruition. So as that supply demand imbalance um, is exacerbated, uh, carriers do have the option to hold off on adding these new ships to the water. Yeah. So overall, our main takeaways currently are that prices have stabilized. We don't expect a real material peak season, however, we are seeing marginal seasonal upticks in certain types of volumes, but really I think that this is more of a sign of um, warehouse uh, inventory starting to wane slightly and that replenishment is happening, but it's definitely happening on a more um, case by case basis, more of more than everyone across the board is starting to see that volume uptick in that peak season present itself. Another thing I think that we're seeing right now to explain the uh, tightness in addition to that hold capacity is that I think some shippers are trying to take advantage of the rates currently before the holiday season, pre-holiday season, or sh holiday shipping season rather, really kicks off um, and saving a bit of money there. Um, but looking back at where we've been, those blank sailings have not been enough to uh, support the spot pricing. That's just now starting to change and we're starting to see those downstream effects of that hold capacity. Um, the back to school season really fell flat, and I don't expect for consumer demand to change overnight due to the current um, like macroeconomic headwinds that we're looking at. We, looking forward, we expect rates to stay pretty weak. And while we might be seeing marginal minor upticks in rates on a case by case basis as we head into, say, August 1st, August 15th, um, we are going to see GRIs implemented and, and some raising of rates. And right now the market does favor it a bit more than it has historically for the past few months. Um, what with potential labor disruptions and backlogs that we've been looking at, Panama Canal regulations, um, the minor, minor uptick combined at the same time as removing all that capacity and that kind of having a downstream effect. So there might be some minor, minor rate increases, but they're going to be fleeting because all of those elements are very much fleeting. We're not looking at an actual shift in consumer demand. Um, additionally, we expect contract rates to be settled at steep discounts compared to the pandemic market. And um, that reliant on reliability and equipment availability uh, is going to keep trending upward. Minding if imports stay down, exports could face some hurdles um, as they head into their bigger season. So looking at the current situation, we see that stabilization and carriers are going to work to aggressively manage the capacity, which we're seeing currently. Um, but that's, that's a nor sign of a very normal market. Um, the vessel queues have subsided and we're not looking at congestion in the way that we were. However, some inland markets on a case-by-case -case basis could uh, suffer, with log suffer from log jams. Um, most shippers have renegotiated those term contracts to be aligned with the spot market and we're no longer seeing um, major disparity between those levels. Um, and we're closely watching the drought conditions in the Panama Canal that could uh, force cargo to alternative routes. Well, there are very few alternative options avoiding the Panama Canal, um, but like changing actual uh, destinations. Moving forward, we expect those spot rates to stay under pressure in the current market um, as consumer demand is going to continue to be low. While we'll have fleeting um, 
market influencing factors that could uh, raise rates a bit, none of them are really indicative of a change of tide per se. Um, carriers are going to compete heavily for those limited volumes, but also manage capacity very aggressively. Um, and we expect, expect that schedule reliability to continue improving with um, the exception of the potential of some bling sailings shifted services currently as we're seeing that shifted mm -hmm. capacity. All right. And uh, if we really summarize it from the factors that people should really pay attention to, I just reveal that we have around 50% of our participants of freight forwarders, I guess, uh, or not container owners. Um, so probably also shippers. Um, maybe we can also share a few uh, factors to them. Do you have a slide on that as well? Yes, oh, definitely. Yeah. So here is what shippers should be watching. Some um, bearish and bullish market fundamentals that could really push the uh, ticker either direction, depending on where we land. But some bearish market fundamentals to consider are we're still seeing a lot of excess inventory. We're still seeing warehouse. We're not seeing it get cleared out at the rate that we were um, last year or the year prior. That being said, some more seasonal goods are starting to be replenished, but it's not really um, that indicator that we're seeing higher consumer demand. Um, in fact, macroeconomic headwinds are pointing to further import declines. So as the Fed has been raising interest rates, though that's slowed, we also are seeing inflationary pressures. Um, more Americans are putting uh, stuff on their credit cards but than ever than historically. We're seeing uh, more Americans defaulting on car loans than we have historically. So there are a lot of different things that are having uh, people tighten their pocketbooks a bit. Um, additionally, we are starting to see that shift back in spending money on services from buying goods. More people are going on vacation, going out, um, and that is having an effect on the demand of goods. Um, lastly, in terms of bearishness, so many vessels are set to hit the water this year and next. And if that capacity is not managed correctly, um, or if it's managed reactively, we are going to have um, stints of more availability and higher supply demand imbalances. Um, as such, we'll also probably see a, a little bit more um, volatility in terms of uh, placement and kind of settling routes for vessels. Um, some bullish, mar bullish market fundamentals to consider are Carriers um, reducing capacity in an effort to be compliant with IMO 2023 regulations, um, potential labor issues, on, especially on intermodal networks and on a market by market basis, producing bottlenecks. Um, and lastly, the vertical acquisition on behalf of carriers of terminals and logistics providers will definitely increase competitiveness in the market. So those are just a few elements of uh, what we should be watching moving forward. Um, but Yvonne, I think that you have some some more details on the uh, the equipment side, so I'm going to pass this off to you. Yeah, that's true. Uh, glad to really hear so many interesting facts about container uh, and freight uh, rates on the transatlantic. And yeah, fantastic, really cool. Um, let me then um, enlarge uh, and share my screen now. Um, I will basically bring you guys to the application the Exchange has. This is called insights and uh, we're currently um, displaying the container price trends on the equipment itself on the east coast i'm starting with that directly so if you follow the the chart you can see over the last like almost yeah 12 months or so um, the price dropped significantly for 40 high cubes cargo worthy units um, so in the trend is also following whatever laura shared with us so it's kind of down um, from the peak side and if we really look a little bit uh, bigger horizon, you probably would see that um, the price is adjusted um, over um, over the period, yeah, but still also the trend continues from earlier of uh, 2022. And I also uh, displayed a few cities that probably um, one of you or some of you are from, um, so you can see that the prices are varying on uh, today's week from like two to one and a half um, K. Uh, for cargo worth the 40 high cubes. If we look at the West Coast, um, I have different cities selected, of course, but you can see the trend is quite similar and the price uh, ratio is in a similar range. So basically the units, the used units, um, uh, still traded. And the interesting part is that if we look at the 
um, availabilities or on the uh, container exchange, there are quite a lot of offerings uh, today. You can see those bubbles representing the number of containers across different locations in US and Canada. Uh, and the interesting um, side is that we have basically US and uh, Canada still leading in the global market. So really good uh, supply today. Of course, um, the difference in prices would definitely represent a situation that somewhere you need to uh, find a, let's say, a bad opportunity, but could be also the other sign that uh, it's a time to actually increase your fleet. Uh, while the price is uh, low, you can actually uh, buy more units and then, um, yeah, start selling once the price goes up. I also brought for you the leasing rate, so often enough interesting uh, for our customers to look from for the pickup charges uh, on the roads from China to US and Canada, and then you can also see that um, in, the big, in the end of the last year, the price the pickup charge for the leasing units was around $800 to $1,000, uh, so basically one-way move um, for 40 high cubes, and then you can clearly see that around um, 300 or even below, this is what we see recently. If we look at the 20 uh, dry containers, I think the price um, is definitely a little bit uh, on different uh, scale, yeah, from 400, but still going down towards 150, $200. There are lots of different routes uh, our customers speak, but that's basically an inspiration maybe for you. Um, if we come back to the slides, uh, Laura, I think I wanna pass back the presentation mode. Yes, let me share my um, screen. Yes. Let me, just a second, it's hidden behind my taskbar. Okay. Yes, basically I have a few uh, topics to follow up uh, for those of you who actually manage the container fleet. Um, so we just go further to 24th. Mm -hmm. So if we wrap up, um, I definitely would encourage you to stay close to the data. Yeah, one more. And one more, and one more, and one more. Yes, it's just a summary of um, the data I just shown to you guys. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if we uh, keep in mind that the data is the key to actually uh, understand what happens in the market, I definitely would encourage you to stay close and inform yourself. It could be uh, any uh, platform you choose, but at the end of the day, we see that many of our customers using the data on a day-to-day -day basis um, get more successful all the time. Of course, um, it's not only about the data, but it's also about the key events. The market is tough, you need to follow on what happens or influencing the factors like Laura shared today. Um, many ports can be uh, still in negotiation and I think you're all aware of that on the labor topics, for example. Um, so um, if you own your containers, of course, consider fleet relocation based on the current container prices and supply level. Uh, something like that can definitely help you to earn more on your units. Um, lease containers, that's also a possible solution uh, for some of you. And also sell containers and locations with the higher prices. That's quite obvious, yeah. And uh, I said uh, previously that probably the right time to increase your um, fleet um, if you do container business as well. Uh, we also have a um, free version of Insights available for everybody to sign up. If uh, you click one more, uh, Laura, um, just summary of the possibilities um, with our application. So you can get actual container prices in uh, various locations around the globe. So if you really focus on Canada and US, there are quite a lot of uh, cities with our pro version, but with the free, we definitely give you uh, a clarity on the country basis. We definitely can maximize a profit by learning when and where to sell. That's um, why we are uh, helping you with the information today. And of course, uh, keep uh, following the market, understand the recent trends, and then uh, follow the key events. But again, uh, this sign up is available for free uh, to all of you. Yeah, and I think we're through on our slides. Um, so thanks a lot. And now we are um, back to question uh, uh, topics. Uh, so guys, uh, if you have uh, any questions, please use the chat. We'd love to answer all of them today. That's why uh, Laura and me, uh, we, yeah, we did get some time uh, to help you out as well. I will go from the beginning uh, of the chat, Laura, and I'll just read it out for everybody then. Um, I see a comment from Andrew. So pre-COVID figures uh, to comparative 
uh, to today's West Coast volumes to West Coast has lower over 1 million TU of freight that has migrated um, arguable permanently to the Gulf and East Coast. And I think that's kind of along the, uh, yeah, the so we're you shared earlier. Yes, we're definitely seeing that shift um, and we do expect it to continue uh, as Gulf and East Coast ports don't want to lose the market share that they have gained. Um, but when we have other variables such as uh, Panama Canal adding potential hurdles to the East Coast, we can see reactive shifts um, could in six months, we could be having the opposite conversation. So, but at this moment, we expect for that trend to continue. And especially as you face hurdles in any location, you're going to uh, come up with ways to kind of hedge your volumes and make sure your cargo gets to where it needs to be. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, and I see the next question probably was already answered, but Kimia asked, could you elaborate on order book definition to order book versus existing? And I think uh, Andrew wrote that order book is a new deployments being ordered and built and uh, launched within the ocean freight. So I think that's uh, totally uh, along the expectations here. Um, good, uh, then I see another uh, question is that we spoke quite a lot on the uh, TP trade. Uh, can you share where you see container rates adding for the transatlantic for Q4 this year and then full year 2024? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, into 2024, it can get more complicated, obviously, as you, we don't necessarily know what the situation is going to be, but we've seen the demand fall off um, a lot in the transatlantic trade. At this point, it's pretty much at parity with West Coast imports. Um, so I don't think that demand for European goods is necessarily going to shoot up, um, but that's finished goods. In terms of raw materials, I think that that trade will, that's kind of going to be what supports it in the next several months. That being said, though, we are looking at um, volume upticks. And one interesting thing I actually saw a while back was everyone was saying that furniture was dropping off. Furniture, 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 which for all intents and purposes was true. But when I was comparing um, furniture imports from China versus furniture imports from Europe, we were still seeing a solid amount of furniture from China at that point, um, whereas Europe fell off a bit faster. And that's because those finished goods are a bit pricier. And as North Americans tighten their pocketbooks, uh, we're not necessarily willing to spend the, the extra cash on a nicer version. That being said, raw materials are definitely going to keep that trade afloat, and I don't expect it to continue trending downward. It has very much normalized in the past mm -hmm. several months, and um, I expect it to stay at its current level, um, maybe start seeing like marginal upticks as carriers uh, manage the capacity on that lane, but I don't think that anything is going to um, blow it up in either direction necessarily, unless we start to see more um, downstream effects of the Russia-Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. All Something right, cool. It could definitely change the, the uh, overall complexion of that trade. Yeah, you also mentioned that uh, basically the carriers would be interested in controlling the rates uh, and then do not let them go too low. Um, so I assume that also affects the upcoming uh, future of this year. Uh, let's see how they will affect the 2004, 24. Yeah, yeah. So we expect rates to uh, potentially gain some momentum in these next month or two as we start to see this marginal volume uptick. Um, but overall, we're not seeing any material change in consumer demand. So while we while carriers are going to make sure that the rates stay at sustainable levels, I don't think beyond what would be our traditional peak season, we're going to see any major upticks in that respect. Um, that being said, on trade certain specific trades, uh, I think that we will see a bit more competitiveness, um, especially the Latin America market right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that any major market factors are going to push up consumer demand to the point that we are starting to see rates go up. Um, and as rates drop down, especially into the sub 1000s into the West Coast, which we saw for a very brief period of time, 
carriers are going to react to that aggressively and push them back up. So while you might see rates at that level for briefly, it will be fleeting because carriers cannot operate on those types of levels. And additionally, another thing to consider as those rates get so low, um, you're going to see more and more operational hurdles. Um, if carriers are not working at a sustainable rate, you're going to see more delays, you're going to see more uh, port operations problems. So just something to consider when um, you are trying to find the best rate. It might not always be the lowest rate. I see. So reliability is still on the big question. All right. Let me read the next question, Laura. So um, can we expect consumer be consumers' behavior to shift from spending more in services, like revenge economy, uh, to getting more into this normal behavior? Or um, is there going to be more permanent shift into spending and services? So what do you think? I don't think it will be permanent. I don't think it will be permanent. Um, I think we are seeing ebbs and flows. But I think right now, with the current economic inflationary pressures that we're seeing, with um, the interest rates having increased several times this year, um, I don't think anyone's going to be rushing to buy all new furniture. But that being said, I do think that um, we're going to start seeing a bit more economic recovery into 2024. So really, we just have to closely watch what the economy is doing, what the Fed is doing, um, and what inflation is doing to kind of predict that market behavior. But unless we start seeing uh, more positive indicators in terms of a de demand, less uh, necessary goods, utilities, stuff like that being put on credit cards, less defaulting on car mm -hmm. loans, we're not going to see an uptick in the material goods until people can uh, pay their bills. Fair, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So Laura, I see many questions about forecast, forecast, forecast. Um, so for intermodal rates for quarter four, I think all of this uh, we we'll try to already elaborate on, but if you need something specific, let us know in the chat. Uh, maybe um, these uh, two specific ones. Um, do we see? Uh, do we foresee any upstream impact on container shipping and ups and yellow shuts down due to union issues? I think that there will be a lot of um, shifting of. Well, it it really depends on like the carrier response. If we actually saw any shifted services, I think the bigger, like longer market effects would be that if you shift a service away from a port, you cannot just implement it back in overnight. That's a really, it's a significant process. It's a lot easier to pull vessels away from a trade than it is to just pop them in a trade. Um, so if we were to see any like continued disruption, I think that that would be one of the biggest things mm -hmm. to be paying attention to. Um, as well as, as I said earlier, the backlog that a strike creates. Um, for every day of strike, you're looking at up to a week to recover that backlog. Um, so that overflow is significant and will continue much past the strike. Um, so I, I think it's something to watch closely and mm -hmm. there are lots of different uh, market effects that it could have. And I'd say the biggest one is that Seattle Tacoma's operations might uh, shift for more volume if they're willing to handle Canadian bound cargo. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, there is also a question about um, the this ratio between Pacific East and Gulf, and will it be, yeah, like uh, staying uh, with the same lead on Pacific side, or is any shift expected significantly? I think we also discussed that, but maybe you have. Anything Unless we start, like the Panama Canal uh, situation worsening could cause some shifting, um, especially mm -hmm. for heavier goods, um, because that's there just aren't a lot of alterior, alternatives. Um, once labor issues are completely settled and that's no longer on the horizon, I think that we could see that. But it's just like I said, shifting vessels, shifting cargo is not the most simple process either. And once you are in a comfortable position, if you're not facing hurdles. Uh, if it's not broke, you're not going to fix it. So unless you start seeing continuously that East Coast rates are continuously higher and there are no hurdles on the West Coast and you're able to get your goods intermodally from the West Coast to where they need to be, um, I don't think that the shift is going to undo itself per se. And I think that ports on the East and Gulf Coast are positioning themselves only to receive more volumes. I know here at the mm -hmm. Port of Houston, we're looking at um, being able to handle larger container ships. So I, I don't think that they're letting go of that market share easily. Mm -hmm. Really good, thank you. 
Um, I think it was also good follow up for the Panama Canal story. Um, so alternatives would be just to shift to the to the other road, right? Or anything. There, so honestly, there aren't a ton of alternative options. There are a few, but I, I, I don't think, um, unless we start seeing shifting services and carriers making moves as a reactive response to those regulations, at this point, there aren't a ton of alternatives. Um, that being said, importers do have the option to switch their destination if you're willing to uh, rework mm -hmm. your intermodal transportation. So I think that we'll be looking at that before we'll be looking at um, carriers make real moves away from it. I see, cool. And then of course, there is also a very specific question about Nashville, Tennessee, and Memphis, if you have any idea about wholesale rates there uh, or any tendency, I guess Warren would love to hear our opinion about that. So off of the top of my head, I do not have a rate. However, um, anyone watching is more than welcome to shoot me an email at that Laura Rob at SP Global. Um, to follow up and I'd love to discuss the market with you and um, exchange information. So just let me know what you're looking for and uh, let's talk. Yeah, yeah. I also think this is really good um, option to remind about our contacts uh, on the slide guys. So if you have any more questions to follow up, please email us, we'd love to, to help you out afterwards. Uh, maybe there is one clarification that could be one of the last questions for today. Um, so, Fahin, uh, actually, uh, um, I would like to clarify. So, and it probably was my mistake as well. I uh, read uh, the UPS wrongly. So anyway, so there was a union strike which will impact the United Parcel Service. Um, oh, so there is UPS. a huge closure. Oh, UPS. Yeah, sorry, I misheard. Um, if, that, if, you're, if we're talking about the UPS strike, uh, yeah. that... When I say intermodal bottlenecks, let me tell you that is going to define intermodal bottlenecks. It would be a, a significant, significant stoppage like America has never seen, honestly. Um, so I, in terms of downturn, uh, downstream effects, uh, it's hard to predict because it's so unprecedented, um, but mm -hmm. I'd say negative across the board. Uh, that would be a serious disruption uh, to all levels of the industry. Hopefully they can reach an agreement soon. All right, yeah, there is also a link for us um, to take a look so everybody can take a look. Um, if you, uh, I guess, the same route you need to share it to everybody, uh, not only to the host and panelists. All right, guys, um, um, I'd like to then follow up. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. We love um, talking to you. Please uh, reach out to us just by email. And uh, of course, um, stay close to the data, follow the events, all important to keep the business uh, upstream. Pleasure to have you today. So thank you very much. Have a good rest of Tuesday. Thank you all so much. Have a good one.